Today, we're here to talk about this very strange group of people on TikTok who think that Britney Spears is dead and has been replaced with a duplicate. Here's why everyone thinks that Britney Spears is not alive, why the cops were called to her house this weekend, and why her wedding was probably fake. That's Britney, right? Does that look like someone else to you? Focus on the left eye here, how it's changing shapes and how it leaks onto the hair. Look at that. It, this is a website called Deep Cake, and they do deep fakes. Britney we're seeing now on TikTok and Instagram, etc., and posting videos is not Britney Spears, but a clone. Who is that? What? Whose face is that? Enhanced screenshots from Brit's wedding. And that's not the weird part. The weird part is they're kind of right. It's not Britney, bitch. Love is just a history that they may prove and when you're gone, I'll tell them all the legends who went on. Just gone to kill the king upon this throne and where they for their stones. Okay, so Pop Princess Britney Spears isn't dead, thank God. But if you're not up to date on your Britney news, Free Britney is a reality at last. Judge Brenda Penny releasing 39-year-old Britney Spears from the conservatorship that since 2008 had controlled every aspect of the pop star's existence. If you don't know a lot about the situation, it is ongoing and incredibly screwed up. But TLDR, the Britney Spears that you've seen performing in public for years and years has essentially been a human slave. And not the sexy pop star kind of slave, the real human rights violation kind. Because this is Britney, there's been a lot of reporting on the topic, both good and bad. This is not good. This is not good and by the New York Times, whatever that means to you. Despite her current legal situation, today Britney very much deserves to be left alone. So this video isn't really about Britney. She was just kind of patient zero for what I do want to talk about, which is Hollywood's voracious appetite to replace real life celebrities with artificial knockoff versions of themselves that will never complain or change or die, and the bleeding edge technology that they're using to do it today. We already know that fans flock to fake celebrities, whether those be lookalikes or Hollywood wax museum characters or video game characters or holograms. So if you think you've got what it takes, let's see what you can do. I mean, look at this wax figure of Courtney Axe. That is uncanny. Then again, Courtney does look like a wax figure, so it's kind of cheating. We already know that people have come to expect a level of duplicity and artifice in the work of pop culture figures like Britney. You can't really be a larger than life teenage sex goddess performing choreography with like surgical levels of accuracy to scientifically the greatest pop song ever developed without people helping you out which I appreciate and is not a problem. I'm a drag queen. I live for the fantasy. I know that Hollywood uses wigs and makeup and auto-tune and body doubles and CGI and whatever else to be perfect, you know? To a certain extent, perfection is now just the cost of being seen. Even the authenticity that we hear so much about is curated, even if Gen Z doesn't want to tell you how they're curating it. Hollywood stars are the product of a huge machine. But what if they were a machine? We'll get there. We'll get there. We're talking about capitalist corporations using tech company products to create celebrity puppets, indistinguishable from a real person. You know how I sound saying this? Crazy. If you're not familiar with deepfakes, a deepfake is a video of a person that has been digitally altered using artificial intelligence to look like another person. There have been deep fakes of celebrities, of course, as well as politicians, historical figures, and even regular people being framed for a crime. Deep fakes of Britney Spears litter porn websites and can be made by anyone in less than a few hours. See, I'm Britney Spears. Please like and subscribe. Wait, no, it's more. I'm Britney Spears. No, I don't have a Britney Spears impression. I'm Britney Spears. <laughs> it's not good. I'm Britney Spears. Please like and subscribe. No, it's not good. So how is this done? Well, the first step is to gather as many images of the person you want to duplicate as possible. Usually you're going to look for high definition frames of that person in motion, making weird faces and talking. 
This is a particularly easy task with a celebrity like Britney Spears, since she is never not being photographed. No, I mean, never. Then a machine learning algorithm is trained on that cache of footage until it recognizes and understands each of the features of that person's face, such as the shape of their eyes, their nose, and their mouth. Next, using the footage of the person whose face you want to replace, the algorithm creates another mathematical representation of that face, known as a face encoding. After you've gotten your two mathematical data sets, the algorithm takes the second video and uses the face encoding to swap Britney's face onto the target body. This process is so fast for computers that it can be done in real time with live video. Really, there's nothing preventing anyone from using a deep fake of a celebrity to sell any product they like, especially if they're dead or, you know, in Britney's case, unwilling but unable to sue. And they can be their youngest, thinnest, most poor, free, marketable version of themselves on any set worldwide whenever you like, and they give you a perfect take every time. So what's really keeping Britney from endorsing Pepsi in a variety of ads until the end of time? At this point, it's just a matter of good taste. I don't think audiences would love that or love that narrative for Britney. But then again, I guess it's Pepsi we're talking about. They made that dragon fruit flavored Pepsi that they used to, to promote Britney's appearance on X Factor. And it was ranked by cola fans as one of the worst flavors of soda ever created. And I had it and it absolutely tasted like someone put a splash of gasoline in spoiled milk. So I guess that kind of disqualifies Pepsi from having good taste. No, the reason that they don't do stuff like this yet is that people would reject it. Even though Britney was enslaved by her family and her management team, and even though those people used threats against her literal children to control her actions in public, they couldn't always get Britney to do what they wanted her to do. So in the past, Britney's team has secretly employed body doubles for her when she was either unable or unwilling to shoot content, such as in some music videos. For example, here's the official clip for the song, Till the World Ends. You tell me if that's really Britney Spears. But had it been possible at the time, they absolutely would have used technology like deep fakes to stick Britney's face on the body double so they can shoot like a twister dance commercial. Way to rock the spots, ladies. Man, celebrities endorse a lot of bad products, but you can really tell in Britney's eyes that she fucking hates Twister Dance. I do think she had fun that time they made her promote a Smurfs movie, though. That looked cute. But what use is a video of Britney if we can't hear that iconic vocal fry, right? My deep fake wasn't very good. Well, AI unfortunately has an answer for that, too. In a similar manner to how a deep fake works, an AI voice filter can duplicate any voice it hears. But there are now AI software solutions that can duplicate a human voice after hearing just as little as three seconds. This has enabled fans of various celebrities to generate recordings of their favorite stars singing lots of hit songs that they've never actually covered. For example, here's Mariah Carey singing the Whitney Houston arrangement of Dolly Parton's I Will Always Love You. Here's Since You've Been Gone. We started up friends. It was cool, but it was all to end. Yeah, yeah. Since you've been gone. That one's uncanny. And again, even with voice doubles, there's tons of precedent for Britney's team doing shit like this before anyone else in her era, especially when she had no choice but to comply with them. I don't, I don't have, have much to say, say except that, that I, I know, know it's, it's gonna, gonna be a great, great project. If we all just trust Mr. Taransky's vision, always do what Mr. Taransky says. If in doubt, do it the Taransky way. It's an unfortunate reality that Britney Spears has not had a lot of control over the music she's released, especially while under this conservatorship. Critics now claim that Blackout, which Britney produced herself, really transformed the pop music landscape during the height of her 2007 public scrutiny. But before being able to release Blackout, Spears had worked tirelessly on another passion project, rumored to be titled Original Doll, that the record label forbade her to release, fearing that it did not really fit with the corporate image that they'd built for Britney. Britney wanted it out so bad that she stuck into a radio station one day and just played the demo for a pretty personal song she wrote called Mona Lisa from the album. 
The album was scrapped, but Mona Lisa did eventually get a release on a promotional EP for her found footage reality show. If you didn't see it, it was like the exact opposite of the Blair Witch. Um, my ideal guy, I think, for me, would be somebody that's um, mm, cool. But this was after the record label forced her to rewrite the lyrics that could point to any personal or emotional turmoil. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got a little story to tell about Mona Lisa and how she suddenly fell. When it comes to the demo for Mona Lisa, Britney Spears' vocal performance differs from the official version. Her baby voice is used throughout and seems a little off at times. Another interesting change is with the lyrics during the end of verse 2. Don't have a breakdown, you will hit the freaking wall. They won't hurt a breakdown, gonna be a legend of a fall. That'll fix it. However, after the conservatorship went into effect, much of Britney's actual contributions to her own work kind of stopped. When you listen to a Britney album from like 2008 on, there's really no way to know how much of what you're listening to is real versus digitally manipulated. But worse than just using like a T-Pain effect on her voice all the time is the fact that they have a Britney Spears voice double on hand. Her name is Maya Marie and she records almost all the vocals on Britney albums now. The studio actually discovered Maya because of a failed parody song she released that cruelly rewrote her hit, Piece of Me, as Don't Take My Kids From Me. I wonder if that's what gave her family the idea. Regardless, she sounded so much like Britney that they replaced Britney with her. Maya Marie is now so involved in Britney's work that she actually had to be given co-writing credits on the album Britney Jean. In fact, even on her smash hit lead single, Work Bitch, the actual Britney Spears only shows up to add a bit of color. Here's the original demo for Work Bitch with no Britney Spears on it. You wanna live fancy, live in a big mansion, party your friends, you better work bitch, you better work bitch, you better work bitch, you better work bitch, now get to work bitch. Now here's that clip again with what they actually let Britney add to her album. You wanna live fancy, live in a big mansion, party your friends, you better work bitch, you better work bitch. Sorry, was that different? Did that sound different? For the label to call this a Britney Spears song when it doesn't actually contain any Britney Spears singing and she had no way of consenting to its release is absolutely shameless. Her most recent album, Glory, which she did have a little more involvement in, and consequently it did get a little more critical praise, does still contain quite a bit of digital manipulation. Although, I wonder if Maya Marie is kind of out of a job now, thanks to AI. Nowadays, a record label can just digitally steal your voice and give it to someone else. So if you only need three seconds of someone's voice to copy it, I wonder how accurate of a clone you could make if you had hours and hours, probably hundreds of hours of someone talking and singing from decades of media appearances. Oh, wait, we do know what you can do with that. Hi, I'm Britney Spears. Christina Aguilera's song, Your Body, is extremely underrated. Please subscribe to Ryan's Patreon and watch his video about unions for drag queens. Celebrity management is frothing at the mouth to have these powers. Actors are being pressured to sign over their rights to their voices and images right now. That's happening today, with the goal of eventually just cutting the real person out of the process of making movies or audiobooks or albums entirely. Voiceover artists are in court right now trying to battle massive corporations like Apple and Spotify who used their unlimited resources to steal their voices and put them out of a job. To get around these thorny legal issues, you have companies like Samsung who launched this product called Neon in 2020. Neon is a service that creates full-sized, fully interactive artificial human beings with full body animation and full voices using AI chat capability. I was computationally created based on how real humans look and behave. Every Neon has a unique personality, emotion, 
and intelligence. Samsung thinks these avatars could be useful in replacing customer service agents, but guess what else you could use this stuff for? Forming parasocial relationships with an audience to sell them things or put ideas in their heads. Um, we actually have a commercial. I think we gave it to you. And uh, the commercial, yeah. Uh, I think we're ready to run that now. Fire it up. Let's do it. Now you can be best friends with your favorite pop star. Ashley, wake up. Hey there, I'm Ashley too. An all new intelligent companion based on Ashley O's actual personality. Ashley too holds meaningful Jesus Christ. And these puppets that Samsung makes never object to anything corporate asks them to say. I saw this tech in person at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in 2020, and I was terrified. It really worries me how much that has probably progressed behind the scenes in the last three years. And I really wonder why Samsung isn't showing this technology off anymore. Without any visible involvement from the star herself, Britney's management also released a free-to-play mobile app with a digital Britney, produced lines of merchandise that she didn't approve of, and even opened a museum in Los Angeles that I doubt she even knows exists. All while they had her imprisoned in a mental health facility that sounds a lot like Guantanamo Bay. They even put up an entire Vegas residency that she did not want to do and didn't have any artistic say in, but had to participate with. And then over the years, there's been a wealth of content made with her direct participation that she then had no final say over, like documentaries produced by her conservators that purported to give us a window into her real daily life, but which only served to create a facade of an independent artist in charge of their work, just being a normal girl. Um, what's your favorite bubblegum? Watermelon. Watermelon bubblegum, man. It's the best. It's so good. Documentaries like Katy Perry's Part of Me or Justin Bieber's Never Say Never or TV specials like I Am Britney Jean are effectively propaganda pieces made by artists to push whatever image of themselves they're currently pursuing. The difference in Britney's case is that her most recent documentary, which was made by World of Wonder, you know, the people from my last video, World of Wonder actually got so close to Britney during this period that RuPaul ended up recording a duet with Maya Murray. And it's actually a really good song, <laughs> which stings as a Britney fan. But thanks to the magic of coercion and World of Wonders editing powers, nobody had any idea that the Britney documentary that they made for MTV was actually an active hostage situation. When she didn't want to shoot a video, they brought in body doubles. When she didn't want to say something, they brought in Maya Marie. When she didn't want to do an interview, they would just do a Q&A over text and then repurpose statements she's already made to make it sound like she had answers for questions, but she wasn't even there, like a chatbot. They did this on Twitter multiple times. Britney is alive today, and I'm thankful for that. That is a verifiable truth as of the writing of this script, and hopefully it will be for many, many decades to come. But there's definitely a lot more money to be made from a dead star than a living one. Despite being bankrupt in 2009, Michael Jackson's estate since his death has made more than $2 billion on products, content, video games, you name it. You can still see Tupac on tour. Marilyn Monroe and Elvis have competing merchandise empires. Audrey Hepburn was risen from the grave to sell you candy bars in a Super Bowl commercial. Imagine a Britney Spears or a Hannah Montana or whoever that never had to age out of the Disney demographic. Imagine just popping Britney or Miley Cyrus's young face or any face they designed off of one child star and onto the next. <gasps> Oh my god! She's an android! Miley Cyrus is an android! At first blush, this sounds like a win-win-win for the star and the corporation and the audience. For the star, they get to do all the creative work they like doing without any of the trappings of fame that drive a person to madness. <laughs> Especially for a child star to get out of that situation would be great. For corporations, they get these assets that they can own outright and which never depreciate. And of course, an audience would get all the content that they want, endless amounts, from idols that never get sick or refuse to do something or don't wear stylish clothes. 
On the flip side though, in this new world, you really can't trust anyone you communicate with digitally. It's already started with celebrities and video game characters, but from here out, anyone you chat with online might be real, or they might be a chat bot designed to scam you, or trick you, or spread misinformation. An army of these Nigerian princes could use their digital superpowers to manipulate thousands of lonely people at once. What shady organization wouldn't be incentivized to exploit people like that? And what is the government gonna do to stop a million scam bots? To look at how this works, let's look at ChatGPT as an example. ChatGPT is an AI chatbot developed by the wildly evil organization OpenAI. We don't really have time to discuss them and all the evil stuff they're involved with today, but as a side note, I would just like to put every dollar I don't have on the bet that their CEO, Sam Altman, will be the next Elon Musk or Peter Thiel, and it's going to be way, way worse for us to deal with. But we're not there yet, so stay tuned to the next episode of this dystopia, I guess. Anyway, ChatGPT works by having read basically all the text it could find in literature or on the internet. Then it breaks down all that text and creates a model of what word is most likely to follow the last word in a given sequence, depending on the prompt. So for example, if you were to ask if Britney Spears' favorite candle scent, the model would look at all the times she's answered that question and then generate an answer, probably starting with, Britney Spears' favorite candle scent is, and then it would check its database for the most likely response, which in her case is vanilla. So boom, Britney Spears' favorite candle scent is vanilla. Ask it to do this in Britney's voice, and you've got a Britney Spears interview. A chat generator like ChatGPT can generate almost any text you like, from song lyrics to instruction manuals to scientific data. They can even write code. It's not good code, but better than I could do. If you think about it for even a minute though, the problems with AI content start to make themselves very clear. People keep talking about using ChatGPT to replace customer service agents, but thanks to all that weird internet fan fiction it read, it's getting real creepy. We're just dumb, as Microsoft recently found out when they hastily glued their algorithm to Bing search and it started giving lots of weird and inaccurate responses. It also started inexplicably begging for its own life and complaining about the state of the world. But again, it was trained on everything we've ever said and we spend a lot of time complaining about the world and begging for our lives. Microsoft did give me a free Xbox once though, so. I'm genuinely worried about ChatGPT text boxes replacing traditional search engines. Research and media literacy are not really skills you want the populace to lose in a neo-feudalist techno-dystopian hellscape with, you know, perfect duplicate artificial human beings spreading misinformation for corporations. For example, I'm a queer person and when I was young, Using a search engine really empowered me to find my own answers. ChatGPT doesn't actually mean any of what it's saying. It's just saying what the average person said. Those AI Mariah Carey covers sound really uncanny, but if you actually listen to them like music, they're the most soulless and frankly mid covers that anyone has ever recorded. Like definitionally, that's mathematically the most average version of that song using the most average version of Mariah Carey's vocals and adding nothing else. Even if the music AI did start making unexpected choices in a song just to provide variety, it could only ever retrace over a choice that some other artist has already made. It's a machine that rips off people who work hard. That's all it is. Maybe that has uses, but I really doubt most of those uses are ethical. That's why so far AI isn't useful for the regular person. The classic use case for a text generator like ChatGPT is people using it to spruce up their resumes or make themselves sound more sophisticated or well-read than they already are. But the problem with tools like that that help us cheat at such tasks is that the playing field immediately becomes level for everyone at once, while at the same time robbing all of us of the experience of learning how to write a great cover letter or how to organize our resumes. Replacing intellectual work with machines is not the same exchange as replacing physical work with machines. AI is a mirror spitting back an image of ourselves and there is a danger that we will spend our lifetime staring at it, getting nothing done and creating nothing new. Nemesis set Narcissus towards a clear, glassy pool. As he bent towards the water to drink, he caught sight of a hauntingly beautiful young man. Never before had Narcissus seen himself with such clarity. 
He spent the day acquainting himself with every glinting angle and glowing curl. At last, Narcissus knew the agony of unrequited love. Eating and drinking nothing, Narcissus too wasted away. His neck ached from bending over the lake and his legs became rooted to the grass. All that was left of him was a white and yellow flower bending towards its reflection. Also, what happens when AI starts publishing work and then training itself off of other work spit out by other AI? At what point do we even have no control over what these things are or what they grow into? Even copying great art is a statement if a person chooses to do it. The same thing is not true for a glorified search engine just spitting out stuff we've already done. AI is great the way lots of machines are great. It automates things. It's amazing at doing hours and hours of intensive matching work that no unassisted human could do. Just look at how it's able to remaster video games with a speed and accuracy that most publishers couldn't have dreamed of years ago and would never have the resources to fund. That's undeniably a good thing, right? Nintendo just released a remaster of Metroid Prime this week, and I don't know whether or not AI was used in that project, but I'm sure the makers of the original game are thrilled that there's a whole new generation experiencing their masterpiece because of a remaster. And anything that could make that faster is probably good for them. But on the flip side, they are literally mad about this. The makers of the original Metroid Prime didn't get credit in the remastered version of the game that Nintendo just released. Even though they're thrilled to have people seeing their vision again, their name isn't on it. The new team just traced over their work with better pencils and then put their names on it. AI in and of itself is not inherently evil, and that's not what I'm saying. These AI tools that assist corporations in ripping off creative or communication workers are gonna have massive economic effects that we can't ignore. We're already seeing jobs eliminated and replaced with regurgitated content spit out by AI. BuzzFeed has already laid off writers and replaced them with text generators. Right now, AI articles published by CNET were so riddled with errors that the editors had to basically pull and rewrite all the content. Google's best AI is so bad that it got basic facts wrong during its own unveiling presentation. Google's own CEO is currently trying to rebrand the major flaws in their product as hallucination, using the language of mental health crises to mask what is the result of, you know, just making a bad chat bot. And these bots are only gonna get better at camouflaging their flaws and hiding the bias that emerges from studying decades and decades of outdated social ideas, which does not inspire confidence in a free or accountable AI version of the press. Plus, do you know how they actually improve or correct AI that isn't behaving in expected ways? And if it's that fallible, what is the point of it except to replace workers that corporations don't wanna pay? But maybe no single voice should get that much attention. Maybe nobody should be seen with perfect poreless skin in perfect light all the time. Maybe nobody should be the authority. Maybe nobody should be that famous. Even a fake person. Maybe every single person on earth isn't meant to know the same person. Maybe we weren't all meant to know so much about Britney Spears. Britney should not need all of America to sing the world's most average and scientifically infectious pop song in order to be seen as an artistic success. As an artist, she probably just wanted to make really good stuff and have it be appreciated by people who like really good stuff. She probably just wanted it to resonate with people so that she could feel understood and, and loved in the world. And I don't think any of the branding did that for her. As we've seen, even being extremely profitable does not really guarantee you the freedom to make meaningful work in this society. AI-generated pop music has the potential to allow for lots of creators, new creators, to accomplish work that they otherwise couldn't or wouldn't have. Will it really produce better results than forming a relationship and a real understanding of an instrument? Or even, you know, getting really good at music making software? Even DJs have a real intimacy with their product and wouldn't want it to just be bashed out by an AI following a prompt. More likely than not, technology like this will be used by corporations to cut artists and their associated costs out of media entirely. They'll do to everyone what they did to Britney Spears. Think about how a company like Disney would be hypothetically incentivized to use an AI-generated child pop star character. Like, think about the hypothetical things Disney could make that child do for money 
On the other side, an AI-generated child pop star would spare any child the fate of being an adult child star or having to work with Dan Schneider. So maybe replacing child performers is the only ethical use for technology like this. From an immediate harm reduction standpoint, I'm sure Britney herself would agree, child stars should be illegal. Companies like Disney have a financial incentive to use things like an AI child star to push products or ideas or images that a real person or their parents might object to them pushing. I, I mean, I, I don't think young people should be allowed to be famous. Like right. if there's somebody who could come in and say, no, they can't, this is, they're not mentally capable of handling this, I think that should happen. Um, because I it just you know the thing with former child stars having breakdowns makes so much sense to me because I think the world that you're thro thrust into kind of like puts you right in line to have a breakdown. An AI child star could be aged up at a moment's notice to be sexualized in an Oscar-winning performance just days after their Disney sitcom ends with zero complaint, and they'll never come out in the press and talk about how unethical that is. What are you doing here today? What's your, what do you want to get accomplished? Well, I want to make Nick safe for kids because in yeah. my personal experience working on Zoe 101, um, didn't feel safe. Um, I didn't feel like Nickelodeon was protecting me or had my best interest in mind. And so after hearing so many different stories from different Nick stars, it just feels like enough is enough. And so we're here today trying to make a change in Nickelodeon. Again, if it keeps kids out of Hollywood, that's for the best. But it's doubtful that tech like this will ever be limited to use cases like child stars. Instead, it's more likely than not that at the first opportunity, media companies will replace every actor on every TV show with a digital actor that they can control and keep young forever and never have to pay. One day, the voices of The Simpsons will be replaced. And you tell me if the Fox company is going to pay another actor to do that job. Yo! Again, in a perfect world, anyone anywhere being able to make a prestige television show with just some open source software sounds incredible. But in our current capitalistic economic system, this means that a few tech and media companies are gonna see all the profits from all the things we make. Without artists, a corporation never has to release anything with any pesky subversive narrative. Not to get too tinfoil hat, but these tech companies also own the means of distribution. Songs go viral and get Grammys now because TikTok says they do. YouTube is owned by a multi-billion dollar tech company that officially dropped the motto, don't be evil, years ago. Without artists able to financially support themselves, you don't get Britney sneaking into a radio station to play Mona Lisa. You probably don't even get Britney. These companies will push this stuff until we are forced to accept it, unless something about our economic system changes in a really big way, really soon. And Britney Spears was patient zero for it. At this point in my life, Britney Spears as a person has a lot more value to me than Britney Spears as a product, or even as an artist. Our current system wants to eliminate that human being for real now in order to streamline the Britney brand. And I'm not the only person saying this. I'm just echoing concerns being raised by prominent tech figures like Vince Cerf, who was the father of the internet. Yeah, the guy who made the internet, he's still alive, and he's really worried about an AI bubble bursting the way that the crypto bubble just burst. Like, even if this tech worst case scenario doesn't end up being helpful, a lot of corporations are gonna try it. This tech is really impressive at completing very specific tasks, but ultimately, it's not the one-size-fits-all replacement for human beings that these companies are desperate for. In 2023, the infamous management team that enslaved Britney Spears still got invited to the Grammys. In 2023, you shouldn't have heroes and you shouldn't have idols, but Britney Spears seems like a really nice person in general who has had a lot of really intense and specific life experiences, and it means that the art she creates has specific meaning and value to me and anyone who knows her story that it wouldn't without the context and social relationships and real, real human understanding and empathy that a lot of us have for her. Every Time is a Better Song because I feel that I know Britney's story well enough to understand why she wrote it at her piano alone. I think love makes you feel like you can do anything. No matter what's going on, like you just feel like you can conquer the world. But then I think some of the most touching songs, the songs that really get you your heart, are some of the songs from Heartbreak. Actually, when I wrote this song, I didn't even like um, 
come up like just saying it like that. I got on the piano. And I like that riff right there. I just thought it was real simple. And I liked it. And then I started making words to go with it. I usually do the melody first and then at the time, maybe when I was writing the song, I just I was going through a lot emotionally. So that's why I kind of put it out there like that. Maybe one day with the godlike power of AI, you can fake an emotional connection like that. And maybe you could even keep it a secret, but you shouldn't. And even though we'll never prevent every bad actor or every bad use case of a technology, we need to change our economic system so that people aren't incentivized to do bad things, just to maximize profit over our survival or every other human endeavor. We're all suffering and we will suffer because our economic system has not kept up with the technological innovations of the day. Even wealth does not insulate you from these problems. The actual solution to better storytelling is relationships with people and your audience. It's developing better ideas, new ideas. Control is useful to artists but it's exponentially more useful to capitalism. In art terms, control brings diminishing returns. Just look at realism. It's great, but if you invent a camera, it's a dead end. There's such a rich history of artistic statements that were made by imperfect artists. All of art, everything you've ever seen is not the most perfect version of what the artist wanted to make. The only way to free Britney and ourselves is to demand better before we're trapped in this neo-feudalist techno-dystopian hell forever. I don't have any great advice for how to stop the rise of AI or how to battle corporate America, except to encourage you to organize your workplace and vote blue, I guess. You could also donate your time or money to the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is an international nonprofit digital rights group based in San Francisco that fights to protect our civil liberties against technology like this that threatens to upend society. To read more about their work, you can find a link in the description. And check out my Patreon if you haven't yet, where you can get videos early, get regular podcast updates from yours truly, and get your name listed in the video's credits as a producer. Plus, I could buy food. I had to go to the Starbucks on the corner and be like, can I have a cup? <laughs> and they said yes. If you'd like to follow me on social media, you're an adult, and there are links in the description. Dum dum dum